This episode of the Party Loaded Podcast is proudly sponsored by Audible.com. Check out their awesome catalogue of audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from. And be sure to grab a free audiobook on us and support the show by visiting audibletrial.com slash endgame. Let's party. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It is another episode of Party Loaded. It is Tuesday evening, the 25th of June. I know, right? 25th of June. What the heck is going on? So my name's Luke Ritalik. Welcome to the show. We have a uh, bunch of the team here. Um, everyone's present, actually. I'm impressed. You're rocked up tonight. We've got Christian, Paulson Brown. we got Yay, Matt, the Game me. Dad Diet. we got Adrian Cheer. The gang's Hooray. all here. What's going on? But especially Hello. me. I'm especially here. You're, yeah. <laughs> Maybe not as jet lagged as last week when we did the, the thing. You, you've actually had some sleep in the interim this time. I, I have, yeah. Yeah. So a Christian with sleep is going to be a sight to behold, I suspect. Mm-hmm. This is going to be good. But To not- make up for it, I've had very little sleep. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, uh, we were having a chat about uh, people who could survive on lack of sleep before. And uh, I think it's probably on that note that we can also introduce our guest for tonight, our very special guest. We have Damon Reese, currently of uh, Route 4. 59 games. Have I got that right? <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah, awesome. And uh, working on a very awesome game called Necro Barista, which we're going to chat about a bit tonight. Um, I'm only hesitating on the name of the company because uh, I wrote it down and then had a mental fart where I was like 50 something. I'm sure it's 59. I'm double get check- checking myself for no reason. But no, we it's, got it's it. named after a tram route in Melbourne, and there are so many tram routes in Melbourne. So cool. cool. Uh, yeah, cool. I don't blame you. So, yeah, I, I mean, not being a Melbourneite, I totally would fluff that. So uh, uh, that's good to know. Same. Yeah. <laughs> same. <laughs> awesome. Are they Melbourneites or Melburnians? What are- uh, is this going to be like the San Francisco thing where they hate being called something? <laughs> I don't know. What, what's the what's the, the, the general consensus, Damon? <laughs> I'm from Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> that's my excuse for everything. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Adelaide's easy. You just call them Radeladians. That's, that's exactly. the one, isn't it? Yeah. Much, much cooler. I think I'd rather come from Adelaide for that reason alone. But uh, Adelaide yeah. makes him sound like rat people. <laughs> rat Adelaide. <laughs> wow, that's rude. Yeah. Look, with someone yeah, with like the a surname of Ritalik, of I think I can relate. That, that, that's fine. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so super full crew plus guest tonight. So Damon, thanks very much for uh, for jumping on and, and hanging out with us tonight and chatting all things uh, game dev and and uh, narrative design, which is kind of what we w- want to get to tonight because it's your your area of speciality, speciality, speciality. <laughs> I'm doing awesome tonight. So uh, I, I've also, <laughs> I've seen on your bio as well that uh, you're something of a, uh, a chief rabble rouser. Is that a, a well-earned title or is that a self <laughs> sort of uh, proclaimed thing? <laughs> What's going on with that? I mean, it can be both, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, You, you do a bit of uh, community management uh, for the studio at the moment. Is that, that kind of part and parcel with uh, rousing a bit of rabble, do you think? Yeah, so... As well as being the lead writer on the game, I'm also currently handling uh, social media and just just general like community outreach. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the tag on my portfolio saying uh, rabble rouser is is also in reference to the fact that like I uh, kind of can't stop myself from like organizing people to do stuff. Yeah. Uh, whether that's like game jams, like resist jam, or uh, the uh, non-binary uh, and genderqueer advocacy uh, organization I, I head. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I, I, co- I co-founded. I don't, I don't head it, but I cause trouble. Yeah. But <laughs> all, all with, like, good intent. Nice, nice. Does that uh, queerly represent me? Is that the one we're re- referencing? No, no, no. Um, they're, they're great, but I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not part of that. We're, we're a non-binary zone. Oh, yes, yes. I do remember seeing that online. So, all right. Cool, cool. Well, um, I... Yeah. I'm genuinely curious, in, curious now because there was that whole thing that Route 59 did with the Tim Tam Slam and the Vegemite. Was that your <laughs> fault? <laughs> I mean, I put the video together, but I, I, I wasn't even in the, well, I'm never in the office, but I particularly wasn't in the office that day. Uh, <laughs> Convenient by design. <laughs> and I'm very proud of my team's ability to be terrible uh, both with and without me. Nice. It was like the, the best Australian shit post. Like, it was so good. <laughs> you have to explain it for the listeners now, Matt. What, what, I, what was yeah, the story? So, 
they they were uh, showing uh, like you you were at GDC or the team was at GDC if I remember rightly or was like around. No, this, this was well. Uh, this was for April Fool's Day. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So they did a Tim Tam Slam and they did a like a, a tutorial video showing this is how you do a Tim Tam Slam, and they spread Vegemite on a Tim Tam. Oh, um, God. yeah. It was it was awful. <laughs> but it was so right. funny. <laughs> Well, they did make that that uh, Vegemite Cadbury chocolate, so yeah. real, real life went halfway there. I, I yeah. would rubbish that, but I tried that stuff and I actually loved it. I thought it was really good. It's really? not bad, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a fan. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's this weird kind of, like, biting caramel. It's like if you ate caramel chocolate and the caramel decided to remove a layer of skin from the back of your throat at the same time because it was so tasty. <laughs> That's kind of what it was. It's a bit extreme. It just tastes like, it just tastes like salted chocolate or salted caramel to me. Yeah. It didn't seem... Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> nice. Oh man, I want some of that now. All right, switch switch the subject before I start to get hungry. All right. Anyway, <laughs> Damon, let, let's uh, stick you in the hot seat, and uh, I, I think probably the natural place for us to start is: um, can we get in your own words, uh, like a, a bit, bit of an intro to yourself, what you sort of do in uh, in the game space? Maybe the the abridged version of the Damon Reese story. We'll let you kick it off. So, who are you, Damon? Oh, I, I mean, I'm I'm a narrative designer who's been working in games for seven years nearly eight years at this point mm-hmm. um I, I've, I've worked for a large number of of teams at this point but most recently i've worked on things like hacknet labyrinths which is an adelaide production uh that's the expansion pack to hacknet mm-hmm. and also worked with uh perth-based uh, surfire studios and as of the past oh geez almost two years i've been working with route 59 on uh, Necro Barista. Nice. And you moved to Melbourne in that time for that particular role? Or, or was that just a natural thing that happened at the same sort of time? Or are you working out of Adelaide now? I actually don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, I've i been working from home this, this whole time. Because uh, uh, I, I live here and there's not a lot of narrative work in Australia, certainly not enough to uh, warrant moving to another city over. So it all happens here. Yeah, nice. The uh, the sort of remote working with the studio will be an interesting one to sort of get to when we chat Necrobrister a bit more. But uh, yeah, cool. So uh, did you say that you've been in the industry for, for sort of about a decade now or just under a decade? How, how long has it been? I'm getting close to it. Like I'm, I'm closer to a decade than, than half a decade, which is kind of scary to say. Okay. Yeah. And has it always been sort of your, your pursuit, your passion, or is it something that sort of happened by accident as you sort of step through different um, sort of uh, projects that, that kind, of, kind of led you down this path? How did it come about? So originally when I was started working in games, um, it was kind of as a, as a pivot from being this, this amateur games journalist, mm-hmm. which is something I was pursuing when I was a teenager. And I was like, damn, there's no money in this. <laughs> I'll, be a, I'll, be, I'll write video games instead. Surely there's money there. Um, <laughs> so much money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that didn't go so well. Um, but... Yeah, so I, I sort of um, I, I moved into working on games, uh, starting with a game called Starbound. Oh yes, I know Starbound very well. I saw that on your uh, on your list of projects. Cool. Yeah, that was my my first project, and then after that, I uh, made a couple games with a small team of friends, and then just sort of moved on to other work from that. So um, Starbound only came out of early access last year, I believe, um, sort of going back by memory. So you would have been involved much earlier on in the, the project. Is that, that the case? Yeah, I was um, the, the first narrative person attached to it in any capacity. Oh, okay. So I was responsible for like a large chunk of what you would have seen in the game in 2014 or thereabouts. Okay. I, I would assume nothing of what I did is still in the game at this point. Oh, I, that's interesting because the, the game as it is now still has quite a bit of uh, narrative content with all the, I think it's like seven different races that are in there. And you do have interactions with quite a few characters from, from those uh, different civilizations. So I'd be very curious to see. That's cool. Yeah. Right. So for example, um, I was pretty much responsible for the base concept uh, and like the base law behind the Nova kids. Mm-hmm. Like that's pretty much all me. Oh, nice. Very, very cool. And the um, the studio uh, behind Starbound, I can't remember the name of it. Were they Australian based or US or? No, that that's uh, Chucklefish. They're based in London. Oh, okay. Th- that's the um, the same publisher that does uh, Eric uh, Barone's uh, Stardew Valley and stuff like that, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Yeah. I think I think what you find as well, like with with Damon's resume, 
like when you talk to a lot of game developers in Australia that kind of fall into those roles that aren't just like programming or art, you you do kind of just flitter between studios and fill in where they need you. Mm-hmm. Because, like, I, my resume is quite the same, like, flitting from studio to studio, providing production support. Musicians are going to have, you know, they won't have a single studio they're attached to. They're all over the place. And narrative designers and, and writers, unfortunately, have the same problem where, like, it's hard to stay attached to a studio for a lengthy period of time. Yeah. It's cool, cool to be able to sort of carve out your own role depending on what the studio needs as well. And I guess, I guess that sort of feeds into to your community management angle that you're working on with Route 59 at the moment as well. So that's cool. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And um, I mean, as a narrative des- designer, you after, after doing it for a while, your, your like third eye opens and you're like, shit, everything is narrative. Like <laughs> the, the way that you're like talking about the, the company on Twitter, like that's that's narrative. You're, you're just like presenting a narrative to people through marketing. You're like presenting a narrative of uh, your your company as or your team as like a, a safe and friendly group of people. If you're like working on moderating your discord, putting together like sets of rules and stuff like it, it's, it's a comprehensive sort of uh, approach to conveying not, o- not only the, the narrative of the game, but like the narrative of you as a studio. Yeah. Like your studio culture and, and bringing that across would exactly, come through with yeah. that. How did you, um how did you first discover that you, um, that this is something that you really want to pursue as, as a career, Damon. I mean, you talked a little about sort of segueing into it. Is it something that you knew you wanted to do from a young age, or how did you um, how did you first get involved with with the idea of of um, working in the industry? Yeah, I don't know. It kind of um, Starbound, at least, kind of happened because it was the thing that I was like particularly interested at that point in time. Um, I had made like a couple of tiny little like half finished things. Uh, before that, because when I started working on, on Starbound, I was, I was still in high school. Mm. Uh, like I was near the tail end, but I was, I was still a student. So I, I hadn't really had any time to get any other experience under my belt. Yeah. Awesome. So when we, we've been talking a lot about like narrative design, but I think for a lot of listeners, they won't be very clear on how that differs from like just writing for the game. Yeah. So, so what would you say is the difference between a, a writer or a narrative designer, and where do where did this where is the kind of crossover between the two roles? So this kind of ties into what I was talking about before. Like, being a narrative narrative designer is taking a more holistic approach to a game and uh, seeing how you can do storytelling or convey narrative through any aspect of the game you can, whether that's like your classical sort of. I'm, I'm going to spit fire and, and say lazy uh, mm-hmm. cutscene approach, like just chuck in some cutscenes. That's the story uh, all the way through to how does our UI art like support the narrative? How does the way our menus work support the narrative? Uh, how are we conveying narrative, whether that's through like environment design, uh, through anything like the, the, the audio filters we're putting on like NPC dialogue, like any of those those elements can be used to can convey and support story. Interesting, interesting you mentioned UI. That's something I've not I mean, it seems obvious, but it's something I've not actually considered before when it comes to narrative design. You sort of just pick it up by I guess by osmosis when you play a game that has that that sort of cohesive theme and you pick up those elements in the I mean, it kinda I, I know this isn't exactly what you're talking about, but it kind of makes me think, what game have I played where I've actually gone into a menu screen and the menu has supported the story? <laughs> sort Persona. of thing. Yeah, Persona yeah. Five, definitely. <laughs> and I actually just watching the trailer for Necro Barista, I haven't unfortunately been able to play it yet. Um, but that's one of the things that, that struck like um, stuck out to me straight away was how awesome the UI looked. How just in the little clips in the trailer on Steam, I can see the UI popping around and, and the writing shuffling across the screen and it just seemed like it was just oozing character straight away from the UI. So I can definitely tell what you're talking about there. It's coming across really, so, really strongly. I'm so proud of the pause menu. Mm. It's uh, it, for people who haven't haven't seen it. It's like it's it's like a, a second long shot in the trailer. So like I assume most people haven't seen it. Uh, when you press escape or your pause button on your controller or whatever, uh, the entire thing zooms out, and whatever you're seeing on screen before that is like on a tablet on a table surrounded by by coffee and and a couple of plates and knives and forks. Uh, you know the standard stuff you'd have on a table in a coffee shop. 
and uh, all of your menu buttons are s- surrounding this this tablet. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, definitely- Damien, in, in that example of that of that pause screen, what what was your um, collaborative contribution to that so, sort of um, situation? Did you did you design it visually, or did you pitch the idea, or what, what is what is your role in that sort of um, in bringing that to life? This is a disappointing answer, but I had absolutely zero input on that. Oh. Um, <laughs> the, the team has a really strong sense of aesthetic, uh, and I, I didn't have a lot of input um, or, or, or maybe involvement on tasks like that. But I, I think even from just looking at how like the script I wrote for Necrobrista uh, got translated visually, like everyone... Has, has, a, has a pretty cohesive idea of, of what they want the game to be. And they all tend mm-hmm. to align most of the time. Hmm. Yeah, cool. Is, is it safe to say that you, you developed the majority of the, of the narrative script for the game? Or did you work in a team? Or was it you on your own? Yeah, so when I, uh, when I joined the team, it was in, in the process of, of Necrobrista having kind of a, a soft, I, I would say reboot in development. So... Uh, a lot of old stuff got thrown away, but but of course the game had been in production for three or four years at that point. Mm. So we had art assets, we had uh, all all of our you know custom tech that we had been well that they had been working on for for the years before that. And so I, I was brought on to sort of write write the the whole main script for the game. Nice. So yeah, right. Cool. What, what was the um was the kind of uh, shift in gear through d- development? Uh, uh, a uh, a real turning point for the project in terms of like where you saw it um, going narr- narratively. Like, it w- was it like a a story that sort of found its feet and and then really kind of you know came together with everybody's artistic vision at the same time? Was it like a, a penny dropping kind of thing, or was it a, a really hard sort of slog to to kind of get it there through repeated iterations? Was it an easy or a hard <sighs> task? I guess is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. So I. I did have a lot of, of groundwork to work off of. Um, I had a lot of uh, stuff that had already been done by other members of the team on on world building and, and characters, and I recycled as much of that as I could. Mm-hmm. Uh, partly, at least, because everyone was really attached to those characters already. Uh, but in regards to writing it, I pretty much had one shot. Because okay. uh, when I was writing it, it was during a very turbulent time in my life, um, and I was suffering from burnout pretty hard. So, uh, yeah, I... I Ended up, uh, it was only meant to take three months to write, but it took a year instead. And compared to most visual novel scripts, it's it's quite short uh, because there's so much more game wise. Uh, and despite that, throughout the whole process, uh, Kevin, the director, and the rest of the team were, were to a fault, just uh, incredibly supportive uh, and accommodating of my need to just like have time to recover. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that the this game has a lot more like game wise going on than a typical visual novel. Can you just maybe just quickly sell me on that the the those aspects of the game that aren't typically visual novel? Because I did see that in the trailer, like you're actually moving around in a three D environment, that sort of thing. So how does this differ from a visual novel? Yeah, so um, th- there are two parts to this answer. First, uh, N- Necrobrista, when I was writing it, I was using the sort of screenwriter's rule of thumb that, you know, one page of, of script translates to one minute of on-screen time. Okay. Uh, that estimate was way off. I got way that off. <laughs> uh, so so in, instead of the game being two and a half hours long, it is significantly longer than that, which I suppose is fine. Uh, and that, that's mostly because uh, people aren't necessarily reading dialogue at the same speed that it would be spoken uh, like by an actor or something, mm. and also there's there's a lot to look at. It's not just your standard two D visual novel with like paper doll sprites bouncing up and down and changing poses or whatever. This is a a fully three D game uh, which has had a cinematographer like touch every single shot, and there are uh, thousands of shots uh, in the game. Yeah, no. so that that's one part of it, and the other part is that we have these. Even though the, the, the main story itself is fully linear, uh, mostly because it would be way too expensive to uh, do one that's, that's not uh, fully linear. Mm. Uh, so even though that's fully linear, um, between each chapter, and there's eight or nine or ten chapters, depending on like how you sort of set them apart, uh, there are these 
explore sequences where you can uh, you, you go into first person and you're able to explore the cafe, explore the sets that we've built, uh, like just appreciate little details. And uh, you can inspect objects, you can um, collect keywords in the main narrative to spend as currency to unlock short stories within uh, the, the cafe sets. Yeah. That's actually that. That's reminding me a little bit of Danganronpa, if you if you know that that series. That just getting kind of similar vibes there. That's cool. Mm. I, I haven't played it, but um, I'm familiar with it. Mm. Yeah, Matt, and I got cool. to see a bit of the keyword stuff at uh, PAX last year, which was which was quite interesting. I'm just conscious for anyone listening, though, we probably haven't set the the stage with the game um, sort of too much. So, I, would you be able to just before we get, get sort of further stuck into to actual game discussion, maybe just give us the elevator pitch for. Uh, Necrobrista for someone who hasn't heard of the game before. What, what are they sort of looking at and expecting? Yeah, okay. So Necrobrista is a, uh, and I can say this because I'm not like involved in the art process. Yep. It is a stunningly gorgeous 3D visual novel uh, about death and coffee set in a Melbourne cafe where the dead or the recently departed go for their last cup of coffee before moving on to the afterlife. Mm-hmm. So is the is the uh, <laughs> is the coffee designed to be so potent that the hope is that the dead will stay awake forever? Or is that just something I'm reading way too far into? <laughs> no, they can only stay for twenty four hours. Uh, okay. Any more than that, and uh, the balance starts to tip, and the powers that be don't like that. Oh, uh, okay. Interesting. So yeah, I would assume that there's some some kind of universal afterlife rules that you've had to design and create as part of the narrative that that sort of feed into to that whole setup. Is that- Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And uh, Ned Kelly is in charge of enforcing those. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. He, he, like that settings version of the Grim Reaper sort of thing. Is, is that his role? Kind of, yeah. yeah. Interesting. I, I, when you had mentioned like audio effects and, and using that on voice to kind of tell a story, like Ned Kelly was the character I thought of. That, <laughs> like that would totally come through, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we ever get the, the game voiced, I will absolutely like- Ensure that you, you can't actually understand Ned Kelly. It's just like echoes inside a bucket. <laughs> awesome. Well, I guess the one thing that really sort of sticks out with um, with Necro Barista is, of course, the setting. Because there's, there's not many games that are, are kind of set in Australia, let alone sort of really dig into the, um, you know, the Australian sort of isms of the setting and, and the, the sort of nature of like inner city living in somewhere in this country at, at its heart. Like, I, I don't think I've seen a single game like that before. And, you know, being such a big part of Necro Bristol, I think it's fascinating and really kind of sets things apart. And the fact that the studio is named Route 59 Games, now we know that's sort of named after a, a, a transit route that all sort of ties in. What what was the thinking behind that? Like, w- was someone in particular dri- the driving force behind that idea? Were there particular must-haves around that setting that, that really had to be part of the, the setting and the narrative? Can you speak to that? Yeah, so uh, obviously Melbourne's coffee culture was was something that they wanted to lean heavily on because Melbourne has this, uh, I hate to admit it, but like a, a really wonderful coffee culture, mm. particularly compared to Adelaide's, which is non-existent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tri- <tri-perth. laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not from Melbourne, but I am, I am from Australia and I've spent plenty of time in Melbourne, so I, I'm able to uh, portray that pretty accurately in, in, including like for example the peop- the characters from melbourne uh just having a couple really vicious dunks on adelaide like that's just a part of the game script <laughs> guess, you, guess you know where the, the pain points are there <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah. this group yeah <laughs> nice certainly um having watched the the twitter and everything as well and and seeing how a lot of the characters talk there's a lot of that kind of Australian manner of speaking that comes through in the characters. I know you've also expressed like just how proud you are of, of making that come across. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's not just uh, the, the mannerisms, et cetera. Like we also have a, a very uh, culturally diverse cast. Uh, and that was really important to me to, even though the, the story doesn't center on that, to at least acknowledge that, uh, that there's a character who's, <sighs> couple hundred years old or something uh it, it, it's it, it's it's unclear how old he is but he first came over to australia during the uh the gold rush from from china mm-hmm. and that's just that's just an experience that is in the game one one thing from the the small amount that i have seen that i really appreciated was the fact that the um aussie aspect of of kind of the setting and the the characters is not something that you're really beaten over the head with 
Like it's not like watching something that was made in the US where the US is trying to depict Australia (laughs) and just using all of the, you know, different stereotypes you could possibly imagine to to kind of, you know, paint that picture from someone who doesn't actually live there and understand it. So they they go to, you know, the easy buttons of what they would get. This is, it just seems very, very natural and just kind of part of of uh, what's there because it is, as opposed to because you, it's being forced upon the the audience. So that that's really absolutely cool. like like yeah. Ned Kelly is is a major character. We've got a, a character who's of uh, Polish heritage, I think, who uh, she builds robots, and one of them is just made out of a goon box, and that's something that like <laughs> Australians will obviously like find super funny, hopefully, but people from other places might not, and that's perfect to me. Yeah. I was- I was also wondering as well, like you, you were talking about the the Chinese character. I noticed on the Steam page it says that the the game is going to be available in Japanese and Chinese. Is that correct? Is that right? Mm-hmm. I was gonna say I was wondering as the like narrative designer, how like what your role is in kind of um, with the translations in keep ensuring that like your narrative and like your intention is still coming across in the other languages. Yeah. So in in the script itself, I have a lot of uh, side notes, like um, ideas on how to compose a shot visually, for example. Like I, 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 when I was writing, I was thinking very visually because I'm working on a game that's that's in full 3D with character art and and uh, well, like 3D characters and, and animations, and uh, it's just helpful to everyone if I'm like very clear about what I want to convey. And when we passed everything to translators, uh, all of that went with it. So. I would say obviously like that was a, a very important piece of context and also like I did write with translations in mind so if there was like a specific like Australian joke I would uh, make sure to like tag that and and explain it not just for our localizers uh, but for the American editor who we were working with as well. That's really yeah. interesting to know that's yeah really cool. Well, uh, the experience that we had doing Symphony and that that had very little in the way of dialogue in it like it was massively challenging um, to make people understand like really simple concepts that we didn't realize were an Australian thing. So I can only imagine how difficult that would be to actually make it come across in a, in a game that, you know, the narrative is all about like a pretty Australian experience. Like it may as well be an anime based in Australia. Like that's the way it feels. Yeah. I mean, for a while I was, I was referring to it as an anime with loading screens. Mm. <laughs> yeah. The um the anime sort of aspect of the game it stands out quite a bit as well, and I think it's pretty clear there's some some big anime fans amongst the team. So that's I, me. Yeah, I mean <laughs> our team as well for sure, and I'm sure Christian's sort of interested in in some of the the specific sort of sources of some of that inspiration. Is there, is there anything in particular that's kind of informed the the aesthetic choice in that regard? Is there a particular uh, style that you're trying to emulate, or maybe the complete opposite, trying to move away from um with force that uh, you enjoy about anime in general but don't want to emulate how does that kind of come together so visually i again like i wasn't involved in in the development process of the visuals but i know that the team was very inspired by stuff like um monogatari uh and and other well-known animes i'm i'm honestly probably the least anime literate person on the team uh (laughs) Like I'm, I'm very picky with my anime, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and very picky with like visual novels as well because I think most visual novels are bad. But that's we can go into that later, I guess. Uh, most but- visual novels are bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I've spoken about several of them on this show that I'm super fans <laughs> of. So yeah, uh, well- Damon, did the um did the anime aesthetic inform the writing at all? Like, did you did you take that into account as you were? sort of running dialogue did, did it inform it at all like is is the art style also indicative of the of the writing style mm, i i would say that the story itself is closer to something like uh at least in in tone and composition closer to something like night in the woods uh, than yeah. uh any sort of traditional visual novel that you've ever seen <laughs> well, put, putting that together obviously there's going to be a bit of an order of operation when it comes to sort of working with the other aspects of the game that are being designed around you while you're working on story content and with the the sort of keywords mechanic that you mentioned before there's going to be a, a fair number of moving parts what, what's your process in, in kind of building all that together do you start off with sort of main characters and and kind of work on crafting narrative around them or do you start off with uh, sort of key story beats and 
and sort of link those together? Is is there a, a process or a collaborative method that you you tend to go to on a project like this? What, what does it look like? Yeah. So when I when I as I mentioned before, when I started working on the the script, I already had a good deal of world building and and the characters sort of there to work off of. Mm-hmm. So the first month or so was just me putting together like story outlines uh, and sort of going back and forth with uh, Kevin, the director, and the rest of the team and seeing what what felt good to them, um, what didn't, what sort of themes they were into. Uh, basically, just just trying to find something that everyone was on board with and that that we could pull off scope wise Ah, scope (laughs) (laughs) it's that creeping theme isn't it (laughs) Uh, i I certainly did find that interesting the the experience you had with writing the script and and thinking that you know a a page is going to translate to a minute and then having it just blow out so much more than that like it's mm. it's really interesting with games and just how you, you can't really factor in the, the gameplay part until you actually see it playing. And then you realize that, you know, your, your script is just such a tiny fragment of a much larger thing, even with it being a narrative game. Mm. Yeah. And, and speaking honestly, like, even though like the scope hasn't changed, uh, in, in, in fact, I'd say it's it's even shrunk a little bit since this time last year. So, yeah, e- even though the game is, is bigger than we expected and gamers love playtime, uh, that's brought up pacing issues which i've had to uh address quite recently just because plot points don't turn up uh sort of early enough for for players to really uh they don't turn up early enough for for players to be like ah yes here's the plot point instead they're sort of playing for a while and being like what's what's this game about and then they stop playing Mm. so i've had to uh do some work recently on on addressing that because it's something that i i totally didn't expect uh, to be an issue when I was originally writing the game. Hmm. So how, I, how, um, how much of your, your own sort of um, passions have you managed to incorporate into the story as well? Like, obviously, you've, you've got a lot of stuff going on outside of your um, game development life with regards to the different groups that you've worked with and the themes of the inclusion and representation and that sort of stuff. How much have you managed to incorporate into to the game's narrative of those sorts of themes? Yeah, so, so representation is important to me. Um, there's Necrobrista is not a vision novel that that centers in any way on romance it, it is a it is a story about relationships but it's not a, anything uh about romantic or sexual relationships mm-hmm. like so many visual novels uh and that doesn't mean that you can't for example have representation of of uh of queer characters or of, of disability um the character who i mentioned before who builds robots ashley she uh, has a prosthetic arm and that that affects her life in certain ways, but uh, mostly because you know she's like thirteen, she's and and she's like a budding engineer. She's just uses it to like strap knives to it. She she has a great time with it. Nice, <laughs> <laughs> as any thirteen year old is want to do. <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, so it, it was very important to me to make sure that like there was uh, representation, not not just of of you know your your stereotypical like. Uh, very very bland visual novel uh i'm being really mean here but like like the sort of very bland by the numbers like visual novel uh queerness written by by straight dudes yeah um and instead looking more closely at you know australia is a a an intensely diverse place uh modern australia is absolutely built off the back of immigrants Mm -hmm. uh and and particularly in melbourne which is like this massive melting pot those people are going to be part of this story, no matter what. Well, I, for one, am very, very happy that the game's not simply going to be full of a cast of characters that represent Victorian hipsters. I think that's a great direction <laughs> to go. So. I never said I wasn't going to have that. <laughs> <laughs> just just sprinkle them in. Don't, like, pour them in. <laughs> uh, the game the game has the word bar- barista in it, so you'd have to account for a certain level of, of hipster true. <laughs> yeah. hipstery content, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But the hipsters are also necromancers, so it's okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's well, ne- one of them is. <laughs> we got to see what a necromantic hipster looks like. That's kind of intriguing <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, tired. She looks tired. Yeah, yeah. I can, <laughs> I can imagine that. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, I, I mean, sort of throughout the, the development of, uh, of the game, because it's been a, a while now, what, what do you, would you say are the, the kind of biggest challenges or the biggest sort of uh learning points um of your experience with it have there been 
some real aha moments that you've you've kind of taken away and and gone wow this has made me a, a much better sort of uh, narrative designer as a result because of this uh, trial by adversity that I've I've gone through or is or is there anything that would kind of stand out as a a highlight with a, a big win during the development what do you think yeah so when I started writing it I was trying to uh, like I I'd worked on vision novels before but. I had approached them in a, in a certain style, which doesn't necessarily mirror like your contemporary standard vision novel with with lots of uh, narration, etc. And uh, early on, uh, the the first revision of the script had a a, a good deal of narration, mm-hmm. but I realised, uh, particularly after seeing that stuff implemented into the game for the first time, that oh, uh, you don't need narration in a fully three D visual novel with animations because you can actually just show and don't tell. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, and honestly, I, I was around that time, I was feeling very self-conscious about my, my prose and uh, just like stringing non-dialogue sentences together at the, like at, at the string those together. And the fact that I got to cut all of that feels great. Nice. So less is more kind of approach and, and knowing when to ease back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Because you, you can you can tell you can convey so much just through facial expressions, mm, mm. and and a lot of my script is just like notes on on facial expressions. Like I was actually going to comment earlier that I I love the fact that like all the scenes I've seen of the game so far in uh, trailers and such, it feels like every scene is an anime pose, mm. and I think that's fantastic. <laughs> like you get so across so much character like with these really exaggerated kind of poses. I I think that's fantastic. I love it. Mm. Yeah, and, and the, the graphics tech behind the faces and like our, our shaders and our tech art, it's it's ridiculous. Um the our director Kevin did a, a GCAP talk uh a couple of years ago on like how we we put together the the art style and it's it, it's it's worth a watch, definitely. It's it blows my mind how how much how much effort they put into this and how good it looks as an end result. Mm. The, the the aesthetic with everything that I've seen so far, whether it's the uh, the spoken word of the characters or just the visuals and the 3D style, it all fits together so well. Like it's it's definitely a a very handcrafted experience from from everything I can tell. And the the uh, difference for me, being someone who doesn't typically like you know these kinds of uh, of uh, narrative sort of games that are you know like you mentioned before the the kind of still. What was the term you used? The, it wasn't ragdoll images. It was um, paper... Pa- paper doll. Yeah, yeah. That, that sort of thing. That, that doesn't appeal to me at all because I think that, uh, you know, the, the scope of storytelling you can do with that kind of thing is, is very, very limited. But this is totally different. I, I could definitely get down with this kind of thing. Very, I mean, very the cool. The thing is, we, we, I think we accidentally kind of made a Telltale game. Mm. <laughs> well, somebody needs to start making them. So. <laughs> I mean, conveniently, that niche has sort of emptied out recently. Yeah. So. <laughs> kind of has, kind of has. So, like, in terms of, uh, like, other sort of game design opportunities and things um, in the future, because when... Uh, also, sorry, just real quick. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to be very, very clear that I think the Telltale situation is absolute bullshit. And, yes. and I, I'm absolutely on, on side with all the developers who, who lost their jobs. Due oh. to ridiculous corporate bullshit. Yeah, totally. I, I think that was, you know, one of several very similar large themes last year that, you know, I think still resonate with what's been going on in 2019 in a lot of ways. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It has been a time for sure. But uh, Anyway, sorry, please do go on. No, no, it's worth mentioning these things when when it comes up for sure, I think. But uh, like, okay, so, so Necrobarista obviously is, is wrapping up development uh, at the moment. It, the game's scheduled for launch on the 8th of August, unless my dates have betrayed me. So it's coming up no, super soon. No, they have soon. not betrayed you. Awesome. Steam says August 9th for us, but obviously that's the time traveling aspect of living in Australia, I guess. So yeah. <laughs> That kind of thing, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yep. Um, so, so you, you're obviously sort of uh, looking for you know new things to work on, and uh, you, you've got a bit of a, a f- freelance opportunity to jump in and do some stuff. But what I wanted to ask you about to kind of close out the interview portion of uh, today's episode was uh, along one of the themes that's happened lately with uh, with Nintendo and uh, the fact that I saw on your um, on your bio that uh, this is how I knew we'd get on instantly, really, really well. You've listed one of your your favorite sort of influences as uh, Metroid Prime, and uh, mm-hmm. I'm pretty much the world's biggest Metroid fan on this show, at least. So I thought, okay, cool. This is something we can we can lead in with. 
if Nintendo came to you and sort of said, hey, we've just done this thing recently where we've opened up uh, the possibility of working on major IPs with uh, independent developers, like what we've done with Cadence of Hyrule, and they said, hey, how would you create a story for a Metroid game? How would you approach that? What kind of story would you create for, for something as big as, as that that you have a, a real vested interest in and as a fan? What do you think? I would love to see... Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I would jump on Metroid in a heartbeat. Yeah. Uh, I, I would love to see something that takes a closer look as, at, at Samus as a character um, instead of, not necessarily instead of, but, but as opposed to the approach of the Metroid Prime games, which have primarily focused on the environments and what's happening around her. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we all know, Nintendo has never made a game uh, in 3D that is focused on Samus's character. It never happened. So I would love to give that a shot. Are we, we're not talking about Other M? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the baby. <laughs> God. Wait, uh, Other M is filed away somewhere with Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. So yes. <laughs> it just doesn't exist. Like, I don't even know the name of the thing I just mentioned. Yeah. No, that's a good answer. I do, I do yeah. think we have, to, we have to drop the mod that you did for Metroid, Damon. Oh, yeah. So I think Metroid Prime is a, is a fantastic, absolutely vital example of how uh, uh, mechanics and UI can inform story uh, in the form of the scan visor, which isn't just a way to uh, interact with elevators and stuff. It's, it's storytelling and conveying uh, mechanics and sort of details about enemies and uh, like just the general texture over the world. Um, and, and this, this mod that, that Matt's mentioning is just me sort of messing around with a, an open source tool called prime world editor, which is, which works for Metroid prime, uh, one, two, and three, and also Donkey Kong, uh, tropical freeze. Oh, that's an name? interesting combination of titles. Yeah, I was just sure. saying, it's a random one. <laughs> mm, <laughs> it's the same Retro engine. Studio stuff, is it? Mm. Yeah. Same engine. Ah, so, yeah. uh, and, and I, I just wanted to sort of communicate like how great the scan visor is as a mechanic through uh modding the game and putting my little persuasive essay into the scan visor nodes interesting nice so i have one last question one last silly question so you're releasing this game on switch correct at some point yeah yep so which character do you put in smash (laughs) (laughs) so i've i've campaigned on on the twitter uh at at reggie who was Obviously left because he's sick of me asking him to put Matt in Smash. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, there's so many possibilities. So uh, the character Ashley, um, she, the, the little robots that she builds, they're called Ashlings. So I could see her as like a sort of Olimar Echo mm-hmm. or, oh. Ned Kelly? Ned Kelly, yeah. Like he, he'd be sort of a, s- occupy a similar space to K. Rule maybe. Okay. Maybe one of the, like a heavier Belmont. I don't know. <laughs> nice. Uh, but like they, they put Joker in, so like Maddie could go in easily. Yeah, totally. They've opened yeah, the door on exactly. that. They, they've kicked the door open on that, in fact. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. it, it's funny. Like, I think asking Reggie's probably the wrong move, though, because I think his general rule to any of those questions is they have to put him in first, and then after that, anything's fair game. So yeah. <laughs> He should definitely be a Smash character. <laughs> yeah, 100%. He's got a puppet. I would he should be him. a Smash character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. All right, well, that, that's awesome. I think we'll, uh, I was going to say, we'll give you a chance to, to rest for a second when it comes to chatting, but uh, we're about to move into our, uh, our what we've been playing recently discussion, and uh, it's only fair as the guest that we ask you these questions too. So, <laughs> Damon, let's let's chat about sort of uh, actual stuff that you're playing as a, as a gamer or a, a games hobbyist at the moment. What, what are you enjoying currently yourself in your, your off time? Yeah, so I've been feeling kind of, like low energy kind of like creatively wiped out recently. So I, I consume a lot of junk food media. Mm-hmm. That said, I, I'm, uh, I'm a really, really big destiny fan. I've been playing a lot of that recently, particularly with uh, like iron banner being this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, also after a brief hiatus, got back into sea of thieves. Cause that's one of my favorite hangout spots. Just, just as a, as a place to, to hang with friends and, and maybe go fishing or whatever. Like that's, uh, fantastic i i love sea of thieves to bits nice i've uh, been enjoying the the tall tales recently yes yeah and they're... also just uh minecraft <laughs> been been building stuff to uh for the purposes of, of zoning out and chilling 
holy shit, I don't know if you actually realize how compatible you are with this group tonight. Yes. <laughs> this is kind of, kind of crazy. Um, well, compat- let's say compatible with 50% of the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. That's fair. Nice. No, I, I think that there's definitely some comfort food themes going on there. I, I think that comfort food uh, themes are heavy at this time of year, actually. Um, yeah. Around that, that mid-time. But- uh, Look, I, I had a bit of a sequence written down for who we were going to get to chat about uh, games they played this week tonight, but I think we're going to just mix this up a bit and throw it to Christian first because- uh, Really? Yeah. Cause, I mean, you'll, you'll understand why when you want to uh, talk about what you've been playing I, this week. <laughs> I played a little bit of Sea of Thieves. Yeah. Um, but it's probably not going to be the <laughs> the opinion <laughs> that, you, that you want to hear. Oh, no. <laughs> um, because so Adrian and I were have been looking for a game to, to play together for a while because we're, we're not particularly big social gamers, but we like to play with each other um, quite a bit. Uh, and so we jumped into Sea of Thieves for the first time now that it's free on Xbox Game Pass for PC. Mm-hmm. Um, and we only probably played for an hour, maybe an hour and a half before I closed the game and decided I probably didn't <laughs> want to play it again. Um, now, look, I'm sure there are plenty, there's plenty of things to to love in the game if, if they appeal to you. But for me, just mechanically, there was something about the game or like the, the gameplay loop that I encountered initially put me off. So the, the concept of, um, you know, we did one of the missions for the, 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 the gold, the treasure chest system. Mm-hmm. And the idea that you... You go and you get the treasure chest and you, you you can't open it. You don't get any loot from it. You just cash it in for gold. And the idea that when you do get upgrades, well, not upgrades, when you do get cosmetics for your, your guns and your pirate, that there are no sort of stat systems underpinning that, that it is mostly cosmetic from what I can tell. And I was just more in the mood for a game that had deeper RPG elements, I guess, or, or mm. st- like deeper statistical elements. Um not to say anything of the, the the narrative of the game or anything like that, but just as far as those uh, stat systems go, I didn't find it appealing personally. So, yeah. The tricky thing with Sea of Thieves, I think, is, is coming out with the expectation of what it is as a game. Like, if you come in expecting it to be a, a pirate roleplay engine, then you're totally not going to be disappointed. But if you're sure. expecting games with deep narrative or progression, then, yeah, I totally I, get It's it. loot. I was expecting more of a loot game. Yeah. And yeah. I, I didn't get that feeling. Yeah. Right, yeah. The, so I think that a really interesting thing um, uh, that at least I've noticed about Sea of Thieves is that it seems like they're really, uh, at least mechanically, like very heavily influenced by like old arena shooters, where there's there's no uh, like permanent mechanical progression. It's only like skill based progression, mm. and that's actually something which really draws me to it because uh, when I'm I'm doing PvP, pirate versus pirate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Like it, it, it's not about whether they have like a, a randomly rolled gun that's better than mine or whether they have like just a, a different sort of sideways progression weapon that's better than mine. It is strictly down to who is better at piloting the boat, who is better at like uh, like exploiting the really interesting like movement mechanics. That's that's really appealing to me. Mm. But I, I totally get why like that doesn't really uh, resonate with you. Mm. Having having come off a massive Warframe high, I. I jumped in with Christian and was like, where's the game? Where is the gameplay? <laughs> oh, is it? And I think probably one of the most memorable moments was after we we collected a treasure chest and brought it back to whoever we handed into. And I said to Christian, what do we do with a chest? And he says, you do this and logged out. <laughs> <laughs> wow. that, may have, that may have been the highlight of the experience, I would say. <laughs> Unfortunately. I, I definitely think like CFT is one of those games where... Um, if you look at like gamer personality types, it definitely sits more on the explorer end. Yeah. And like Christian, knowing the games that you play, like you probably don't sit as much on that end of the, Maybe. Of the spectrum. I, I think it can depend on the aesthetics of the game for me in that regard. Like I, I do love exploring and getting immersed in like games that I consider like beautiful or, or really like engrossing. And visually, I don't really like Sea of Thieves either. I don't, I don't mm. like the 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 character design i don't like the the world design obviously the the water graphically looks nice but the the actual art i'm not a huge fan of so that put me off too mm-hmm. yeah that's fair enough yeah it's a preference it is un- unfathomable to me but <laughs> I, I, i'll respect it but also did you know that uh the uh the water like every single tiny wave every single bit of froth or foam is synced perfectly over every single client in that server 
What? That that's really impressive, but sadly, it doesn't make the game fun for me. <laughs> no, that's understandable. I, I also, <laughs> super pretty I really just a fun fact. I really appreciate the the unfathomable water pun that you threw in there. That's great. So, <laughs> shit, I didn't even mean to. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, no, I didn't know that. That's that's super cool. Yeah, I can yeah. I can see I I can see potential there for fun. Oh yeah. I think I think it just needs. For me, anyway, for my taste, I think it just needs that extra bit of mechanical drive, and I think I, I need the I need the carrot to be dangled with the promise of you know finding a weapon that has better stats to keep me sort of engaged. Yeah. But I, I that that Unreal comparison that you used, Dame, was was a good one. That that made me sort of perceive it in a bit of a different light. Um, and perhaps with a full crew of pirates, it it could be more enjoyable too. But it's definitely like a BYO fun game. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I, like, I suspect if like, you jumped on with with Matt and I, you you probably have a good time because we we would oh, yeah. go, get up to some shenanigans. That, yeah. That's what we said at the end of the session too. When when we logged out, I was like, I'm probably not going to play that game again, but I'll give it a shot with with Luke and Matt and mm-hmm. see how that goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's yeah. it's one of those games where like um I, I find it similar to to Borderlands for me. Like I hate playing Borderlands alone or with one other person, but you get a big group of friends and it's just chaos and fun. Mm. All right. Well, um, on the topic of chaos, Matt. Why don't you tell us what you've been up to? Uh, okay, so um, I probably pissed off a lot of people last week. <laughs> <laughs> so so I finished Doom 2016, and I kind of want to just briefly touch on that, because I'd said that it was overrated, and in hindsight, what? that was really unfair. Yes, it was super unfair. <laughs> and the the reason I, I kind of realized that, you know, it's not overrated. Like, I think for me, it was overhyped, mm-hmm. and- that was detrimental for my enjoyment of the game because I went in expecting more than what I got out of it. My bad. I own that. My bad. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And certainly, like, stripping away all the hype and taking the game for what it is, like, it is a groundbreaking um, game in terms of its design. And there's certainly flaws in it. Like, I I realised looking back as well that the reason I kind of dropped off at the halfway point wasn't because I was playing Destiny at the time. Mm. It was because I had seen everything the game had to offer. And basically from the halfway point to the very end, it's more good stuff, but it's more of the same stuff you've already had, Um, which isn't at all a bad thing. Um, I just think that, yeah, like if I had gone into that game without the hype um, to begin with, I probably would have enjoyed it much more and not actually gone and said that was overhyped. Like, because, yeah, I, I think there's definitely a degree of hype in there for people that you know, we're expecting Doom 3 levels of Doom and then got Doom 2016, which is admittedly substantially better and a dramatically different game. Mm. Well, in terms of avoiding hype um, for future Doom games, Matt, I've got some bad news for you. Is um okay? <laughs> Look, to be fair, I am on the hype train with you for okay, Doom Eternal. Cool. Yeah, that's true. You will get to experience it at the same time. That does make all the difference. So yeah, yeah. I mean, um, they, they took a they took a Metroid Primey game and made it even more Metroid Primey. So I'm yeah, yeah, extremely excited. It, it's funny actually. Like t- t- talking about um, the Doom Slayer as a character and how they they kind of portray him in a, a, a narrative sense with the way he, he kind of uh, develops throughout the games a little bit. It's not that dissimilar to how Samus is in those games, really, because you kind of experience a lot of it. With oh, I guess no, Samus actually has spoken dialogue as well, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah. she has like some context. Whereas I don't give a shit about the Doom Slayer. Yeah, and that's fine. <laughs> yeah, you don't really need to. Yeah, the, the Doom Slayer is very much like Master Chief. Mm. Like mm. you, it, it's essentially a skin for you as the player. Yeah. Um, and it's it's all about making you feel like a badass. Yeah. Oh, uh, but but Matt, have you played Halo Four? Yes, I have. <laughs> oh, I, I I I really appreciate that they they sort of turned away from that though in in Halo Four. Yeah, oh, I, I I find it really interesting the characterization because I'm gonna get really nerdy here, but like the Halo books, right? The characterization of the Chief in the books is so good, and that never really carried over into Bungie's Halo. Mm. Um. Mm. But I'm certainly looking forward to Halo Infinite and, and seeing where they take the Chief from here. I, I wasn't a fan of um, 4 or 5 so much, but I did like the characterization of him. And he had a lot of badass moments that, you know, the Doom Slayer seems to have in Eternal as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I can't get this image out of my head now of the Doom Slayer killing every single demon in hell except for one baby demon. And then that baby demon, like, starts looking at the Doom Slayer <laughs> as a paternal figure. And then... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Like, <laughs> I love it. I, I think there's potential there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. um, 
but yeah, so um, in, in addition to, to finishing Doom 2016, there were two other games I wanted to talk about really briefly. Probably the one that I'll talk about first, because I have less to say about it, was this game called Overcrowd, mm-hmm. um, which is uh, marketed as a commute em up which makes it sound much more exciting than it is. Um, it's, it's a really cute little game. Like, it's a lot of fun. So it's basically uh, take your sim hospital, but now you're making a train station and you've got to get commuters into a train and, you know, move them through the train station. And you're managing staff and building train stations out and everything. And yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's really cute. Um, it's early access and there's it certainly feels a bit difficult because it's basically like, hey, yeah, you know, you have all this money to build a train station with, but then to upgrade the train station, you're- upgrading it from ticket prices which isn't a lot of money to kind of um, build up a train station from but yeah i i was kind of playing around with that as a i was just i guess i was in a mood for like a management type thing and i didn't want to dive into stellaris just yet what um yeah no i i wanted to have something that was a bit more shallow than than stellaris well, like if i get into stellaris ever, Matt, so let's yeah. narrow it down a little bit <laughs> Yeah. Like, yeah, and, and this, um, I had seen a YouTuber playing it and I was like, you know, that looks really cute and I love trains, so stuff it, let's get it. Mm. Um, and yeah, like, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, on the other hand, my f- friend Pedro, holy crap. Can you, can we start with the trailer? <laughs> yeah. Oh God, that trailer is so good. Mm-hmm. Like, talking about nailing the gameplay feel, like that trailer does such a good job. Um, because a lot of the time with gameplay trailers and movie trailers, mostly gameplay trailers, like- they, they show off a whole bunch of really cool stuff. But then when you play the game, you never really feel like that. Mm. Um, my friend Pedro's uh, release trailer. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch it because it's so good. But it absolutely nails the feeling of actually playing the game. Um, and, and it reminds me a lot of the way I used to play Halo 3 back in the day where I would go and play a level. And then my objective would be to finish the level, which is the easy part. But the hard part is finishing a level and being absolutely badass on the way mm. um and my friend pedro is basically that it's it's like it's easy to finish a level because you can die and then just continue on from the point you died at and then you'll finish the level but you won't feel particularly good about how you did so you'll want to replay it and be much more visibly awesome in it mm. um so that you get really cool gifts that you can share online which is what i've been doing <laughs> yeah they're pretty good um momentum is king in that game like you want to you want to keep up your combo and like it just it's such a fun game um it it feels like a little side scrolling doom essentially um i i reckon you would actually really enjoy it um luke if you haven't actually looked at it I, yet it would- speaks very strongly to my uh, preferred aesthetic so i i'm down with that for sure yeah yeah it's over the top ridiculous and i absolutely adore it um, it's basically like, hey, look, let's let's take some little bits and pieces of like Deadpool and um, mix it with, you know, Keanu Reeves and the Matrix and just all these different other aesthetics. And like you can you can get through an entire level basically just in slow motion as long as you're killing things along the way because it refreshes your bar. Ah. Like it's so good. Oh, it's the slow motion is so mechanic. Fun. I didn't realize that. I yeah. thought that was just something on the replay. Okay. Yeah. No, it's a mechanic. Mm. It's a mechanic. Um, and it's almost necessary to use, quite honestly, because they'll just throw tons of enemies at you. Mm. So yeah, no, it's a lot of fun. I've been really enjoying it. Nice. Oh, well, um, I'd like to talk about a game I've been really enjoying this week, um, which I'm actually curious if Christian's put any more time into, but uh, we'll get to that in a sec. So I've, I picked up on release Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. So this is uh, Koji Igarashi's, uh, the original sort of, uh, was he the creator of Castlevania? Or yeah. Ma- yeah, he was, yeah. So he his uh, sort of new <laughs> Castlevania-esque style uh, 2D um, side-scrolling platformer, um, which he's uh, made um, sort of independent of, of Konami. And uh, I, I mean, let, I'll just say it straight up. It is a Castlevania-ass Castlevania game. <laughs> this thing is, <laughs> it is Symphony of the Night, like in 2019, pretty much. And I am 100% okay with that. So, um, and it's it's real, real good. Like I'm enjoying the heck out of it. It is, uh, I, being a massive Metroidvania fan in general, these are the kinds of games that I really get, gravitate towards. But it, on top of that, he's actually managed to blend in a bit of a JRPG sort of visual novel style with how the story is presented. It's a lot more story than what you'd typically get in one of those games. Um, and instead of the story being sort of done on screen with the the sort of characters um, sort of in the action as it has been in previous Castlevania games, this one is very visual novel style with the um, the sort of paper doll sort of images of, of the characters coming up and doing the dialogue. 
Um, but it kind of fits this aesthetic, like in a strange way. Like it, it actually adds a lot to it as opposed to to sort of taking away from it. But uh, it's it's super weird. Like it, you take away Dracula, and instead you've got like this dude who's obsessed with uh, magic um, derived from uh, demon crystals. And your main protagonist is also like a warrior who sort of works with the power derived from these crystals. And, you know, she has to have this delicate balance of not taking too much of it into her own body lest she become corrupted, that kind of thing. But your, your entire progression system during the game is is very reminiscent of uh, Symphony of the Night. Like you're, you're sort of, you know, you're working up building a, a, a uh, an area of equipment that you can use, um, upgrading your, your magical abilities. You actually do level up in this game. So your, your stats increase and that kind of thing. But on top of that, they've laid in a bunch of uh, extra mechanics around crafting so you can actually craft your own weapons um the the different sort of uh magical abilities you can pick up and and level up you know give you a huge diverse range of things that you can attack with and and some of them have really stunning sort of visual elements that explode onto the screen as well um there's one uh, in particular which you you pick up fairly early on and it's um i mean it the way it explodes out on the screen it's almost like a final fantasy limit break where you you kind of activate it and it's it's basically like a demon hentai tentacle party like everywhere, just destroying all of the enemies on screen. It's it's glorious. So, yeah, <laughs> super super good. I love the aesthetic. Um, but it, it's a very very modern feeling game um, for the the genre because there's not a lot of those that have been made in recent times. I feel so. Um, like visually, especially some of the bosses are just absolutely gorgeous, and the the visual effects in the background are the thing that I really love about this game. Like you've got your you sort of set pieces where um, like a lot of the the scenery um, it is very bright and vibrant, but then you've got a backdrop that often sort of moves in different and unexpected ways to kind of convey this sense of scale. And there's this one scene in particular where you're actually running into the um, the main castle at the very, very beginning of the game. And there's like a, a you can see the castle sort of in the background as you're running um, along this bridge and all of the sort of uh, pillars and and sort of the bridge itself is in the foreground. But as you approach, the entire castle of the backdrop kind of swings around and gives you this impression of actually running along a curved bridge, even though what you're seeing on screen is a straight one, and just the way that it sort of pans around in the background. It's really creative the way they've done it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big, big fan. The gameplay is tight as hell as well. It feels very, very responsive. Um, you know, the the jumping and uh, and fighting and all that kind of stuff is, is very smooth and... Uh, and feels good as a platformer. You kind of want that to be the one thing that they nail above all else. But uh, I only have one complaint about the the mechanics of the game, and it's a it's a little one, but it's one that I find dumb as hell. So you, you have all of your your various different weapons and things, like from um, you know small daggers to short swords to big claymores and stuff like that, which have varying different attack speeds as you go. And uh, most of those um, melee weapons have like an arc of effect where you sort of swing them in front of you, and there's like a space in front of you where it's affected. You also, on your other hand, um, sort of cast your spells and you can use the right, like if you're playing on a, um, a game controller, you can use the right thumbstick to sort of direct your hand in a 360 degree arc to be able to cast those spells. Now, I think that's great, but the dumb thing is that there's certain weapons that you get um, that have a ranged effect, like a, a flintlock pistol or various different guns, that because they're regular attacks and not magic, you can only fire them directly in front of you or behind you which I find so stupid given that you've got like the ability to aim in a 360 arc with your magic. It was like, why can't they let you aim in different directions with the other guns? So anyway, I just find that dumb. So yeah, but that's that's the game. I'm, I'm super enjoying it and I'll probably Sounds talk good. a bit more about it in uh, future weeks. Do, do you end up playing any more, Christian? I know you sort no. of get a copy through your backing of the Kickstarter, but uh, yeah. yeah. I, I got my code for the game. I have it in a, in a Word doc on my desktop, mm-hmm. but I haven't actually uh, popped it into my PS4 yet. I, I want to play Castlevania 4, Super Castlevania, um, and Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night before I actually play it. I know that it's not a Castlevania game, yeah. but I have this thing about, like, I want to experience the, like, the lineage of that style of game uh, first before I before I play uh, Bloodstained. So I think that's totally probably, fair. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get to it in a few months. No rush. One one thing I would say is that I think that maybe playing Symphony after playing a lot of this it may sort of uh, detract from your experience of Symphony. So yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, 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 for sure. Nice, um, Adrian. What do you got on the boil this week? What have you been doing? Mm, so I I was uh, I, I managed to hit a wall with Darkest Dungeon. So I, I played probably another twenty odd hours since our last. Um, discussion of it on the <laughs> on Jeez, the podcast. So, that time. Yeah, 
Yeah, I was smashing it, but not actually making a lot of progress. Like I found myself getting into a bit of a into a bit of a rut. So um, I decided to give the Xbox uh, Game Pass a go, um, and because the beta is only a dollar, I was like, yeah, I could out of the library isn't you know amazing, but for a dollar, you can't complain. So I thought I'll try a couple of games. So I, in, I installed uh, Marvel vs. Capcom. And I installed a couple of other games. Um, but in the end, I was like, oh, the Surge looks interesting, but do I want to play like Diet Dark Souls? Mm, let's give it a go. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely not Diet Dark Souls, which which I assume is a stigma that it's pr- was probably always going to have to shake. Um, it's really good, and I'm I'm really engaged by it. So I think I've sunk about thirty hours into it so far. Jesus! Wow. Um, and I even got about five hours in and started all over again because I accidentally killed some NPCs, and I was like, no, and there was no way to get them back. And I was like, ah, fuck it, I'll just start all over again, and I did. So that is probably a testament to to how it's good. Um, so the setting the setting is sort of. Um, uh, what's the right word? Not not dystopian because it's not dystopian. Like sort of, fu- it, it's set in the future. Um, it's got a very it's sort of industrial vibe. So imagine uh, imagine a soul style game, but set in sort of like an industrial, um, very sort of like workers workers revolt kind of setting. Mm-hmm. Um, and the main the main sort of aesthetic. It revolves around you wearing an exosuit, which are those sort of suits that you see in movies like um, Elysium. Um, oh, what's another one? I had another one on the top of my head, but I've forgotten what it was. But, Edge um, of Tomorrow? Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah, Edge of Tomorrow. So those those style of sort of um, exosuits that, are, that sort of exist in our time, um, but are not quite at the stage where you can sort of wear them all over the place. And um, the idea is that um, your character gets fitted out with one of these exosuits, you wake up in like a disaster zone, and you have no idea what happened. And so there's a bit of a like um, a detective kind of note to the story where you're kind of un- unraveling what's happened and, and what's caused the disaster. Um, but uh, another huge sort of visual element of the game is that all the enemies you fight are either humans in exosuits or robots. So there's no like big demons or organic kind of enemies. Um, and I was expecting that there might even be, you know, some Resident Evil style bad guys, but I haven't faced anything like that. It's all either been robotic or, or human in, sort of in a suit or something like that. And it, it's it, it does borrow heavily from from Soul. So I know that Deck 13 also did, um, is it Lords of the Fallen was their previous sort of yeah, foray so. into in, into the Soul genre, which um, sort of was criticised for being a bit dumbed down and a bit sort of too easy. Um, and from what I've read, they kind of went back to the drawing board and came back with the surge. Um, and it's it's very polished. It's very clean. The combat is a little bit quicker than a Souls game, but certainly has a lot of weight to it. Um, one of the main mechanics that makes it quite interesting is that um, every almost, almost every enemy in the game, when you target them in combat, you actually target... Um, either either of their limbs, their torso or their head. And then as you do damage to them, um, you eventually stagger them and then you can sever um, the part of the body that you were targeting. Uh-huh. You can then pick up the scrap from the part of the body that you've severed and you use that scrap to craft better armor and better gear. That sounds very Monster um, Hunter. <laughs> yeah, kind of. It's, it's on a much smaller scale though. So instead of farming... Um, like huge, a huge boss over and over again. You're just farming like little dudes. Mm. Um, the, the enemy variety isn't huge. Like I'm even sort of 20, 25 hours in, I haven't seen a great variety of enemies, but um, it is still fun. Um, another major difference is that rather than a huge sprawling overworld, um, it's more like um, each... It, 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 the game seems to be divided up into about five or six different zones, and each of these zones is like a smaller version of like a larger Dark Souls style overworld. Um, but instead of a bonfire system, there's just one home base, which is called um, the op the ops room. And from that ops room, you s- tend to sort of go out on these like kind of mini raids where like you'll you'll, you'll push to see how far you can get, similar to a Souls game. And then eventually you'll realize that you either have to head back with your tech or scrap, which is the equivalent of souls in this game, 
or keep going until you eventually unlock a path that leads back to the safe point. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there's an interesting dynamic between you know how much do you keep pushing? Should you turn back, et cetera, et cetera? So um, I won't I won't go on too much more about it, but that kind of gives you a bit of an idea of, of what it's like. But I, I I'm quite enjoying it. Um, I I really like the visual style of the game as well. So it's nice to play something like that that isn't set in sort of a medieval kind of environment. Yeah. yeah. Seems like a good price too. Seems good. Yeah, for a buck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't go wrong. <laughs> yep. Yep. It game- really flew under the radar. Like. Mm. Yeah, I I remember seeing it and like never thinking about it again. So and even and and like I say, I had to convince myself to play it, even mm. though it was basically free. Yeah, like, like it may as well have been free. And even then, I was like, mm, it's always the time oh, cost. It's, it? never, it's not so much the monetary cost for a lot of us. It's yeah. yeah. Mm. Now that I'm into it, though, I'm really enjoying it, and it's making me want to play Sekiro because the the combat is sort of getting my kind of. I don't know, muscle memory kind of fired up again. So yeah. mm. we'll see where that goes. Nice. All right. Well, uh, we're getting towards the end of the episode, but we've got uh, one last thing to do before we wrap up. And uh, despite the fact that it's, uh, you know, still E3 month, there are a few news <laughs> items cropping up. So uh, let's chat a little bit of news. Now it's time to hear some gaming news. Time for some gaming news. Okay, so on the list tonight, um, just a few minor ones. Uh, I just want to kick off with uh, something that is probably a little humorous, but also a little, uh, you know, face palmy, head slapping, just bad. Um, so EA has been added again. So uh, one of the senior executives at uh, Electronic Arts has been appearing before the uh, the UK Parliament on the uh, the topic of uh, you know the use of their loot box mechanics in games, and uh, you know the. They've actually, you know, put together a House of Commons committee to to investigate uh, the the links to gambling and those sorts of things. And obviously, EA, EA being the one of the big recent offenders in in uh, last year and and this year and other recent times is kind of in the spotlight. And uh, during that, uh, <laughs> they they actually mentioned um, they were asked they asked by the uh, the House of Commons basically if they had any ethical qualms about their use of loot boxes. And uh, they they then compared the loot boxes that they have in their products um, to uh, to things like Kinder eggs, like Kinder surprises, um, because they they refer internally to their loot boxes as surprise mechanics, and argue that their use in uh, in their games is quite ethical and fun and enjoyable to people. <laughs> so um, now, the, obviously, the internet's been having a bit of fun with this uh, during the week, and uh, you know this is is kind of been caught up in the the conversation at large about. EA being pretty tone deaf and not really reading the room as far as the impact of their, their loot boxes and and uh, you know the the flack that they've copped in recent years about it, but um, I mean, how does that sit with you guys, a company describing those sorts of things as surprise mechanics and not? What do you what do you think it, about it, that? It is certainly surprising to look at your bank statement and then see that there is less money in there than you expected <laughs> because you spent all the loot boxes. Yep. But on, on, on a very serious note, um, I'm someone with with ADHD. Uh, and a a big part of that is decreased uh, impulse control mm, mm. and general susceptibility to things like surprise mechanics. Uh, <laughs> so I, 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 I think it's it's loot boxes in general are just kind of gross. Don't use psychology yeah. to take people's money. Mm, mm. Don't do it. It's evil. It's bad. Don't do it. So. I like that you said gross because I think I remember using that word last time we talked yeah. about loot boxes. How it's just kind of slimy and gross, and yeah, we kind of just do it, but no one really questions it, and just sort of you know, yeah, it's, like just takes don't, the don't exploit my my faulty brain wiring to take money from me. That's rude. Yeah, yeah. 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 What I find especially like ridiculous is that EA at the same time on uh, like their their E three show had people up talking about like, oh, there's no loot boxes in our games. Yay. Yeah. And it's like, and they were calling them loot boxes then and when they were t- saying they're not in the games, but when they are in the games, oh, no, 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 they're not loot boxes. They're, they're surprise surprises. mechanics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I love that, uh, you know, that comparison to the Kinder Surprises as well. It obviously flew over their head that Kinder Surprises are banned in the US because they are harmful yeah. to minors because yeah. they could choke on them, the toys. So, um, yeah. Uh, let, let's be honest. Kinder eggs are chocolate loot capsules. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, uh, EA doesn't have the chocolate part going for them. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a super good point. Yep. Oh, man. Oh, well, speaking of uh, choking and dying on things, um, 
back onto our favorite Agent 47, uh, Hitman 2, um, is getting an expansion. <laughs> so, uh, Matt, did you hear that, uh, that 47's coming to New York soon? Yes, yep. I did hear this. I, I'm super looking forward to getting back into it. Like, it's one of those games where I want to just play more, but with everything else that I'm playing, it's hard to find the time. Yeah. Uh, the the one thing that um, frustrates me about Hitman for that reason in particular, because I'm like you, I get distracted by a lot of other things too, is that whenever they have those timed events, like particularly with the elusive targets, and I feel like I've missed out on them, that's a real detractor for my enjoyment yeah. of the game. So, yeah. But, I mean, this one may not fall into that category. It's um, part of the expansion pass that they have had planned for a while. So, um, expansion pack one is going to um, contain this new location of New York. And also there's a a, um, a mission that's going to come with that that actually slots into the campaign called The Bank, um, which I I mean, I would assume it it's sort of uh, trying to assassinate somebody in the middle of a heist of some sort. That sounds like a cool setting. So yeah, yeah. that would be really cool if it was like mid heist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, o almost it brings back sort of memories of uh, the opening scene of The Dark Knight for me with uh, Joker mm. taking out all of the rest of the crew as they're kind of completing that bank heist. So, yeah, something like that would be very, very cool. But, uh, yeah, more Hitman, super good thing. So uh, bring it on, I say. Absolutely bring it on. Um, and uh, the last one that I'll, I'll just mention before I throw over to uh, to Christian is uh, a little Hearthstone nugget because I think we can't sort of escape talking about this. Um, the uh, the Hearthstone team mentioned this week that there's some, some big um, sort of uh, changes coming to the game in the very near future, which is so super unexpected. Like they've done this a few times um, throughout this uh, expansion cycle where they've actually dropped big card changes on us um, outside of the usual release cycle, which has been surprising and good, the, the fact that they're being so reactive to, to how the game's going in the current meta. Um, so for a while, there's um, been a trend of them sort of moving some of the, the super powerful cards or the, uh, the cards in the game that see play in almost like all of the, the main decks where they've, they've kind of moved them into what they call a uh, hall of fame to deliberately force a bit of, uh, you know, mixing up of the meta and to stop people from going back to the same sort of uh, go-to cards that, uh, you know, many of which are actually in the basic and classic sets of the game that it's sort of uh, always going to be available no matter what um, sort of rotation of sets is, is in the game currently with the, the standard format of play. Um, and they've, they've moved these cards into the hall of fame. But what that, of course, has meant is that a lot of the different class sets um, have uh, had cl uh, cards removed and they haven't had anything to replace them. Um, so they're actually adding a bunch of new um, sort of cards to those various different classes to the game to fill some of those gaps. Um, but what they're really doubling down on is is sort of being clear about what each of the main class themes are. So they're trying to make sure that like rogues, for instance, um, don't have easy board clears. Instead, they rely on sort of pinpoint sort of, uh, you know, mass damage dealing or poison tactics to, to sort of get rid of enemies on the board and... Uh, you know, that priests are more about healing and not just doing massive amounts of face damage because they had a couple of nasty cards that allowed them to do that. So they're sort of getting back to what the roots of the class stereotype should be. So, um, yeah, so it's some kind of surprising changes and the timing was certainly unexpected. But uh, I think the general design direction that they're taking is really good. And I'm I'm very happy that they're, they're responding so quickly. So it's good. I, I think it's really good too, yeah. Yeah. What, one thing I really like is that what they seem to be do doing now is not just removing or Hall of Faming cards that are overpowered, but cards that are restricting the design space. Yeah. So, like, one of the cards they Hall of Famed, um, just in this latest news, that the Priest one, Mind Blast, that's a card that on its own isn't isn't overpowerful, but what it did is it restricted the the sort of diversity and the breadth of cards they could design for the Priest class because anything that kind of copied spells or reduced spell costs that Mind Blast was there as like a an, an exploit. Um, so, so yeah, not, not just about the removing cards, but opening up design space within the classes. I think it's, it's a really clever way of doing it. Yeah, for sure. Agreed. Yeah. Um, quick thing I wanted to mention because I thought it was I thought it was funny is um, there's a game coming out today actually called Samurai Showdown, which is a, a, a fighting game from SNK. Um, and I mean, people outside of the FGC community, not many people are really paying too much attention to it. Um, but some news popped up in my feed that the the developer or the the director of the game was recently interviewed uh, by a Korean website, um, and he mentioned in the interview that he he his team was approached by he didn't he didn't exactly say Epic Games, but he would they they were approached by a, a PC uh, platform that offered them an exclusivity deal, and the exclu exclusivity deal would have guaranteed hundreds of thousands of sales. So basically, they said that there's a they basically epic or this this platform would buy hundreds of thousands of the game straight away as a as like a pre pre purchase um, if they came to it uh, that their platform 
but the they the director declined the offer saying uh, saying that he's confident his game is going to sell millions um, and the the hundreds of thousands isn't isn't enough and the quote is that he's confident in the perfection of his game wow um, yeah <laughs> and i think it's just kind of like it's it's almost like charming that he, he he's so confident about his game he loves it so much that even if he's being a bit unrealistic he's like no like your offer of hundreds of thousands isn't enough we're going to sell millions um, <laughs> that's awesome and it probably feeds yeah. into the, the the game um sort of uh, media as well because if people catch wind of this story they're going to be like fuck yeah i'm going to support this guy <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think so too it hasn't hasn't really escaped too much outside of the FGC at the moment, this news, but yeah, it, I just thought it was was funny and kind of charming, and I hope the game does sell well. Yeah. I'm sure his team's going to get plenty of exposure. Mm. 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 Exposure yeah. bucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so uh, last news item for the evening, so um, Bungie recently announced that there was a whole bunch of changes that they were bringing to some exotic weapons, and one of the weapons that seemed to be getting a, a nerf was a exotic uh, shotgun called Lord of Wolves. I've got um, this thing. It's a monster. I love it. Yes. <laughs> so it, it the the nerf to it like reduced damage, and um they didn't make it entirely clear that there was a mode um for Lord of Wolves that would kind of um activate automatically called Release the Wolves, um and it would basically fire double shots. So it's essentially a shotgun that fires almost like a pulse rifle burst. Mm. Um. So in the in the season of opulence when they started it off the change that they made to Lord of Wolves was to actually make the release the wolves mode on it a toggle so you could just turn release the wolves on all the time but the damage was reduced so it had technically been a nerf but with release the wolves on all the time rather than something that would trigger every now and then um it turns out it's massively overpowered um and currently there's a lot of PVPers that are complaining about it weirdly enough it's still like not overpowered in PVE, like it's not the best uh, DPS weapon. I'll tell you it one thing be- it's really good at, though, is melting primevals and gambit. It is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, it, it, like single target damage, like it, every shotgun in the game is actually really good for that. But Lord of Wolves, I could totally see it. Um, but yeah, the interesting news item out of this is basically Bungie's said, yes, we're aware of the fact that it's currently overpowered and we are going to nerf it, but we're not going to rush out that nerf because we don't want to make our team crunch. Mm-hmm. Um, and so basically I've, I've spent a, a good chunk of time today on the, um, Destiny Reddit explaining from a producer's perspective, like, oh man, yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> uh, like why He's is it that, the wolves. Uh, He's feeding the wolves. <laughs> <laughs> why is it that a, a, a nerf like this would cause crunch? Um, and I, I want to just really talk kind of briefly about that, but, um, so, so Bungie, um, are really interesting as a studio because they, uh, from what we know, from what they've said, like they killed Crunch at their studio and, and overwork a long time ago. Um, and so they, they managed their, their tasks like really, really tightly. And so I was basically explaining to people. So when you have a, an agile project methodology, you're, you're essentially saying we can complete this many tasks in this amount of time. Um, and so rushing in Lord of Wolves as a change um, if they're prioritizing stuff for Shadowkeep, which they should, mm. right? Um, adding Lord of Wolves as a change on top of that, even if it's a small change, like any small change in any game is never small. Like I'm using finger quotes here and you can't see it. Like their team will want to test and rebalance that. And there's, you know, it's never as easy as just, oh, just just roll the weapon back to the way it used to be because that damage nerf probably impacted on other weapons as well. But yeah, like, it, I, I think it's really, really cool. Like, um, Bungie's being open about this. Like, they're saying, hey, yes, we're aware that it's an issue, but don't expect a change to happen quickly because we don't want the team to crunch. Um, and, like, a, a lot of people are obviously like, well, why is it this simple? Like, this is totally not fair. It's ruining my game experience. But, yeah, there's not much you can do to kind of convince people that this is a healthy thing for a studio to be doing. Um but yeah, I'm I'm really proud of my bungee. I got to say. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was also say just quietly, it's not ruin, ruining my game experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, nice. All right. Yeah, it's it's been nasty. Um, I, I like I, I've been playing Iron Banner and I've I played enough of it to sort of finish the entire quest for the entire season in one week. And, Jeez. Uh, I found found out that the way you counter it is by just staying more than twenty meters away from the people running Lord of Wolves. Yeah. So <laughs> don't don't. Riding around corners because you're gonna die. Yeah, it 
it spawned some fantastic memes, though. Like, hey, yeah, did you realize that if you went and um, dismantled your Lord of Wolves, you get <laughs> yeah, all of these things out of it? Like, oh, there's a secret emblem for dismantling Lord of Wolves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That, that would be an interesting fix for Bungie to put in temporarily. It's almost like uh, when- um what was it? The um, the beam weapon that was ridiculous over had Prometheus, Prometheus lens. lens. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, when, when they realised that that was a problem, and then they just basically gave it to um, Zer for one weekend and just let everybody yep. have access to it. It's like cool. Yep. We can't fix this just yet, but if everybody has the same tool to play with, ha- knock yourselves out. <laughs> so yeah, like like it's, it's one of those things where they kind of lean into it, and I think that's actually a really cool idea. Like mm. being like, yes, this thing's overpowered, but look. Here, everybody has it now. Have fun. Yeah. Right. And and I think that most of the Destiny community is perfectly happy with that. Um, it's it's always the outspoken people that are like, this is unacceptable. Um, but yeah, I, I think it would be hilarious if after Lord of Wolves got nerfed, like they released an emblem um that was available to everybody that played at any point while Lord of Wolves was broken. Mm-hmm. That's, That's what like, they're doing, actually. They're They've, doing that? The ad, they they have confirmed that they're doing that. So anyone who's oh. played Iron Banner like this week. Or until I nerf it, I guess, is, is getting uh, an Awu emblem. That's so good. I, I Yeah, like the, the description of that emblem should be like, I survived Lord of Wolves and all I got was this emblem. Uh- <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Could be a, uh, a mod to the gun, which adds a muzzle to it or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's cool. All right. Well, that pretty much brings us to the end of uh, of the episode. So, um, thank you very much for hanging with us, Damon. Appreciate your time and and come on to chat all Happy things. Happy to be here. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's been been super great. Sort of hearing about everything you've worked on, and and uh, I'm really looking forward to Necro Brewster. I'm, I'm very yes. very pumped to play that game proper. Yeah, it's gonna be good. But I'm um, like you're obviously sort of uh, looking for for other sort of uh, opportunities in the the sort of game dev space and and more narrative design and that sort of stuff. If people want to see more of your work or if they want to get in touch with you about that kind of thing in general, where should they hit you up? Um, yeah, I have, I have a website. Uh, you can get to it via damonreese.com. Um, we can chuck my socials in the show notes, I guess. Yep, yep, can do that for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, sweet. All right, well, um, I, I guess that's pretty much it. Now, next week, um, because it is the uh, first episode of the new month, it's going to be our Party Game of the Month episode, and uh, we are going to be re- uh, reviewing a little game called They Are Billions. So, uh, yeah, lots of uh, RTS zombie action, which I'm looking forward to, to chatting to you guys about. So I'm going to play a bit of that during the week. Um, I might see if we can um, I can strong arm one of you guys into doing some some stream stuff during the week with uh, They Are Billions, because I think that's a super fun stream game. <laughs> one person commentating mm-hmm. on the other person failing dismally sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> so one of my students keeps on harassing me to play it mm-hmm. and to play it on five hundred percent difficulty or something. Oh my god! Don't, <laughs> don't do that, <laughs> especially not for your first game. The the game will murder you really quickly. Yeah, so. I expect so. <laughs> yeah, nice. All right. Well, uh, yeah. I, I guess that's pretty much it. So um, thanks everybody. Thanks Christian. Thanks Adrian. Thanks Matt. Yep. Thanks Damon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back again next week for another helping of uh, everything great in the world of video games. But for tonight, thanks for listening and good night. Catch you, gang. Bye-bye. The Party Loaded Podcast is a Channel Endgame production. For this and more great gaming content, bookmark channelendgame.com.